Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And coming up in today's newscast, the new Joe Biden administration's foreign policy begins to take shape. Meanwhile, Israeli lockdowns are set to be extended in light of the continued spread of new coronavirus variants. And meanwhile, finally, Tu Bishvat is marked today, or Israel's holiday of the trees. So stay tuned to see how you can celebrate safely amongst the pandemic. We begin today in the United States, where the new Biden administration's Middle East foreign policy is finally just a little bit more fleshed out, leaving Israelis with a couple of concerns. With a slew of new directives, executive orders, and reversals of Trump-era policies, many worldwide are left wondering where they stand. The United Arab Emirates, for example, now waiting in limbo with respect to the $23 billion purchase of F-35 fighter jets from the Trump administration, which was advanced in part through the Abraham Accords for normalizing ties with Israel. Likewise, the sale of munitions to Saudi Arabia has been stalled pending review from the United States State Department. As for Israeli leaders, they too are waiting for further details in order to get ahead of any other potential conflicts of interest. With the new nominee for U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, taking point this week and highlighting some of the other initial promises and changes that have now been made. So if I am confirmed as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, I look forward to standing with Israel, standing against the unfair uh, targeting of, of Israel, uh, the relentless resolutions that are proposed against uh, Israel unfairly. Additionally, Thomas Greenfield vows to be a voice against the anti-Israel BDS movement, which she says, quote, verges on the anti-Semitic, following similar promises by acting U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Richard Mills. The diplomats explaining that in order to affect change, the United States has to be an involved partner, as opposed to President Trump, who attempted to punitively withdraw from or renegotiate with several international organizations and agreements. But at the same time, returning to a more supposedly diplomatic approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, officials are defending Biden's choice to restore support for the long-stalled two-state solution negotiations. This, in addition to resuming contact with PA leaders and restoring financial aid for the Palestinians under the guise of preserving stability. President Biden has been clear in his intent to restore U.S. assistance programs that support economic development and humanitarian aid for the Palestinian people, and to take steps to reopen diplomatic missions that were closed by the last U.S. administration. We do not view these steps as a favor to the Palestinian leadership. U.S. assistance benefits millions of ordinary Palestinians and helps to preserve a stable environment that benefits both Palestinians and Israelis. These payments were cut by the Trump administration, however, over the Palestinians' continued salary payments to convicted terrorists, as well as the fact that many of these organizations, like UNRWA, stand accused of perpetuating the conflict with biased narratives and support for Palestinian violent resistance. Meanwhile, with over a week in office, Biden has yet to even speak with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, with some claiming that the supposed snubs reflect hopes to withhold any achievements that might boost Netanyahu's chances of re-election in March especially given the rift between Jerusalem and Washington over how to address Iran, which began between Netanyahu and the Obama White House. That said, many argue that Biden is simply following traditional policy in calling Canada, Mexico, Britain, and others first, while the new Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has already called his Israeli counterpart, Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi. Now, meantime, among the biggest concerns going forwards, of course, is Iran. But the new Biden administration's approach to Tehran and, by extension, the 2015 JCPOA nuclear deal leaves much to be desired here in Jerusalem. New Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, for one, repeating claims that the United States will happily return to the deal as long as Iran returns to compliance first. Similarly, United Nations Ambassador nominee Linda Thomas-Greenfield promising to push back on Iran's nuclear aggression. We'll work and make every effort to ensure that the Iranians do not gain access to a nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, over the past four years, we've seen a tremendous amount of backtracking since we pulled out of, of the agreement. 
But officials in Iran are taking further steps away from the controversial nuclear deal, warning on Tuesday that the Biden administration will not have infinite time to rejoin the agreement, and that Tehran expects Washington to reverse Trump-era sanctions first. Then, meanwhile, on Wednesday, Iranian officials repeated threats to demolish Tel Aviv and Haifa should Israel make the, quote, mistake of attacking Iran or Iranian interests. Israel, on the other hand, refusing to wait and see, repeating promises to fight Iran wherever and whenever necessary. And now here to provide us with some more insights into the evolving United States foreign policy is Professor of Communications and International Relations at Barilan University and expert on American-Israeli relations as well as on U.S. Middle East policy, Eitan Gilboa. Professor, thank you so much for being with us. Now, the United States is saying that the Iranians must return to the nuclear deal and show that they are following it before the United States returns uh, to the deal themselves. But Iran is saying that the United States must first reverse sanctions uh, and comply with the JCPOA themselves before they do. What do you think is going to happen? These statements uh, seem to be irreconcilable, but they are. These are only uh, uh, opening statements in a pre-negotiation phase. The sides are just... Um, uh, presenting what they should, what they think should be done first. Uh, the solution is a gradual um, uh, approach, which on the one hand uh, would reduce gradually uh, America, um, the American sanctions, and in return for gradual stop of or for the Iranian um, recent uh, violations of the 2015 agreement. This means compliance for compliance. Both sides are eager to sign a new agreement. So I think um, this is what we're going to see in the next uh, few weeks. All right, well, with that in mind, I mean, we're basically talking about negotiations between Washington and Tehran, and, and historically in the Obama administration with President Biden as vice president, uh, you know, they, they got a lot of flack or, or a lot of criticism for their lack of negotiating skills Opposite Iran, uh, opposite Iran. So, uh, you know, looking back on the uh, Obama and Trump administrations, do you think that the Biden team has learned anything about how to negotiate and, you know, from their previous so-called weaknesses? Hopefully, they they are, uh, they, are they had learned. Um, the Iranians are much better negotiators than the Americans. Uh, there is always a tendency to believe. Uh, sides that sign agreements. This is not the case. Iran has been cheating and lying about its uh, nuclear weapons program for years. There is no reason to believe that this is going to change. Uh, if uh, the Biden administration people who uh, negotiated the 2015 deal will be busy just proving that they were right, the agreement was good, Trump's was wrong, then obviously they would be making the same the same uh, mistakes. Uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, the United States robbed itself of two important um, uh, uh, cards in the negotiations. First, uh, they were too eager to sign the agreement. Second, they re they de facto uh, removed uh, the military action. It seems that these two conditions are still present today. And it, uh, it, it um, gives advantages to the Iranian side. All right. So I, I want to move over to a different part of the Middle East now, to the United Arab Emirates uh, and, and to Saudi Arabia, for that matter. The Biden team now halting munition sales and the sales of F-35s, uh, as negotiated by the Trump administration. Is this going to have any, you know, retroactive effect on the Abraham Accords or, or on peace and, and ties between the United States and the Gulf and Israel in the Gulf? It could, but there is a difference between the, UA, uh, the UAE and the Saudi agreements. I think that um, there should be continuation in policy 
And if uh, the Trump administration signed an agreement, uh, the Biden administration should follow through. Uh, the, the United States, the Democrats, are not that happy with America mm. uh, selling sophisticated weapons to any of the Gulf countries. Um, the radical uh, branch of the Democratic Party, which call itself progressive, think, uh, thinks that uh, these um, countries uh, in the Gulf are the most reactionary in the world. From Saudi Arabia, I think they would seek a commitment to stop using bombs on civilians in, in Yemen. I think that I think that the agreement with the UAE uh, will be will be implemented. All right. Well, we are waiting anxiously to see the results of, of what will happen next. Uh, we hope to have you back at that time, Professor Gribo. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, in other news, Gideon Saar's new Hope Party is causing a powerful stir in the Knesset as several of Netanyahu's most prominent Likud members, among members of other parties, are joining his cause. Joining us to break down the new Hope Party's platforms and more is former Likud Knesset member and current Knesset candidate for the new Hope Party, Sharen Eskel. Sharen, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the show. All right, so let's just get started. You know, you left the Likud. Talk to us a little bit about the decision behind that and, and what you think the biggest differences between the Likud and New Hope are? Yeah, it, it was a very difficult decision for me to make, uh, but uh, I know it was the right choice uh, and the right decision. I, I have to explain something. It might be a little bit difficult because to understand the inner politics in mm -hmm. Israel. Um, but the Likud that you see today is not the Likud of even just a couple of years ago, uh, before. Uh, in uh, uh, Bibi that you see today, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is not the same Prime Minister Netanyahu that was there before. Um, and seeing so many red lines that the Likud and Bibi have crossed in the last year, and I say it with great disappointment and a lot of pain, uh, made me to make the right for the right decision to join Gideon Saar uh, in changing the current government and starting a new road. Israel is under uh, a serious economical crisis. We've seen uh, uh, Bibi uh, refusing to pass a budget, a country's budget. He had three months to pass the budget. Uh, in while we are uh, in huge debts. Uh, when we have a, a, a huge amount of percentage of unemployment, when we see businesses who are closing down, uh, it's devastating uh, what is happening to the Israeli economy right now. And what we need is a long-term plan, a long-term budget to get us out of there. Well, so, so I have to ask, you know, on platform, right, how different is the platform? Because, I mean, we're talking a little bit about you're saying your red lines that Netanyahu and other members of the Likud have, have crossed, apparently, you know. But on, in terms of platform, what is the difference between the Likud and, and New Hope? So, because of the Israeli politics with C situation today, that tr Prime Minister uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, with all the great things that he's done, and he's done some amazing things for the for the for our country and for our people, is at a point today where he is unable to create a coalition, to build a coalition, and not to build a stable government. Um, we've seen that we've gone through, um, uh, this is the fourth election in two years because he's incapable of building a coalition and fulfilling uh, election promises. And what we want to do is build a stable government that will be able to bring our ideology, our reform into light for uh, our uh, electorate. So, so, all right. So that being said, you know, let's say that the New Hope Party, you know, wins as as the biggest party, which right now I think you're you're polling in third. Um, you know, do you who do you see as your natural partners in a coalition? Well, um, there are I think uh, uh, ten parties that we can sit with. Uh, I'm not dealing now with constructing a certain coalition, uh, but we have uh, uh, seven guidelines for our party, and on those guidelines, we will build a coalition, a stable one, that its main cause uh, is to first uh, make sure that Israel is getting out of the economical crisis that we're at at the moment. 
we have to pass a budget. It is unheard of, never been before that Israel is without a long-term planning for more than two years now. Uh, it is ridiculous and definitely not at this time when it, it's so needed. Um, and so uh, this is the, the basic guideline that with that we are going to start constructing a coalition, a stable one that's going to uh, serve for four years and that's going to apply or going to join us uh, with uh, specific reforms. We have three main reforms that um, are our main goal. Uh, we've published them. One of them speaks about eliminating uh, the crime within the Arab communities, mm. which is uh, some of the, uh, we see a, a huge amount of illegal of weapon, yeah. violence against women, uh, you know, uh, uh, murders that we see in the communities. Uh, so we have a, a full plan on how to eradicate that. The second one is to reform our judicial system. And this is also, we have a few sections uh, of legislation that we have to pass in that. It's very well needed in order to uh, regain the trust of the people back in our judicial system. And the third one is a change on uh, the way that we elect on the election system in Israel today. All right. Well, I hope to have you back as soon as possible to discuss more of the policies in New Hope uh, and, and how that's going to play off uh, with future crises and, and crises that are ongoing. Sharen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Moving on, Israeli government ministers meeting again this week to discuss another extension to the current coronavirus lockdowns. Khan Rifkin with the details. The number of coronavirus hospitalizations in Israel showing some signs of slowing, but not quickly enough, as more and more patients appear infected with the more contagious UK mutation of COVID-19 and particularly amongst the ultra-Orthodox community, which continues to clash with government authorities over lockdown restrictions. The new number of active infections now at nearly 75,000, at least 1,178 in serious condition, and the death toll likewise climbing by several dozen overnight to 4,612. Authorities warning then that lockdowns must be extended by at least another week, in addition to stiffening fines and closing all border crossings into the country, effective 6 a.m. this morning. Is this a question of time before we hit a strain that uh, the current vaccines are not susceptible to it? And because of that, the risk that that would happen, I uh, shut down the airports because I can do something that other countries I think would like to do too, and they might be able to do it, and that is to inoculate millions of people in the time that I close the country and try to win the race between mutation and vaccination. And Netanyahu later going on to explain to the Israeli public what they can expect from the coming weeks. I hope לעזור גם לעסקים וגם לאזרחים. אני מצפה מכולם לשים את הפוליטיקה בצד ולהתגייס כאיש אחד. Now speaking of Israel's continuing vaccinations program, addressing the Davos World Economic Forum on Wednesday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu laying out the cold hard predictions for future life in the wake of the pandemic. And spoiler alert, vaccine or no vaccine, it does not seem like COVID is going anywhere anytime soon. You ask what's the challenge? We're in an arms race. Except it's not an arms race, it's a race between vaccination and mutation. The mutations, uh, especially the British mutation, but there'll be more mutations. There are more mutations, there'll be more mutations in the future. Uh, means that we have to probably expect the uh, uh, companies that are producing the vaccines at this point to modify their vaccines to accommodate the mutations that they don't cover now as they develop. And then we'll have to purchase them. Uh, that's going to be our life uh, for the uh, uh, coming years. Learn to live with it. That's the general message coming from Israeli leadership, which itself is leading the world in the inoculation campaign against coronavirus. But while expectations are that vaccines will need to be regularly updated, like annual flu shots, current initiatives are just focused on beating back the current pandemic crisis through delivery of the current Pfizer and Moderna vaccine iterations. Deputy Health Minister Yoav Kish mirroring Netanyahu's language in that we're in a race against time. If the vaccine would not be effective against the mutations, then uh, 
the it's it's a we went back in the disease six or eight months backwards. It's like a new thing coming up. We'll have to wait for a new development of vaccine that will give the answer against this mutation. That's the main issue. Uh, we are optimistic because as of now, the uh, uh, knowledge regarding this mutation is that the vaccine is effective against them. And with that in mind, Israeli HMOs are now opening vaccine eligibility to anyone aged 35 and up, with the rest of the population slated to be eligible in the next few weeks as well. Upwards of 2.8 million Israelis having already gotten their first doses, and nearly 1.5 million more having gotten their second. And this accounting for the inoculation of roughly 80 percent of at-risk Israelis in little under a month's time. And finally, today is Tu Bishvat, or the New Year of the Trees, a.k.a. Israeli Arbor Day and the coming of spring. But yet again, Jews around the globe are having to adopt into COVID-friendly celebrations. So here to share some Jewish wisdom and encouragement on how to make the most out of the situation, Rabbi Ariel Constantine, founding rabbi at the Tel Aviv International Synagogue. Rabbi, thanks so much for being with us. Now, normally, Jews celebrate Tu Bishvat with a festive meal, lots of seasonal fruits and grains, and the planting of trees. But for those of us having to celebrate yet another holiday in lockdown, how can we still have a meaningful Tu Bishvat experience? Well, I think Tu Bishvat, first of all, is meaningful because we connect to the land of Israel, we connect to nature. Historically, it was an agricultural marking, but yet the Kabbalists, when they came back to Israel in the 16th century and established a community in Tzfat, set up a number of spiritual foundations for it, uh, exploring the four Kabbalistic worlds and reconnecting to the land and always having hope. I think about this symbol of Tu Bishvat as the Shkedia, the almond tree that blooms two months before any other thing, any other tree blooms. I remember in America growing up as a child and thinking about spring when there's snow around. What does it mean? But already we're thinking ahead. We're thinking optimistically. We're thinking that there, hope springs eternal. There's always a future. There's always a brighter way. And therefore, I think even in these dark times and people are really suffering and challenged and, and it pains all each and every one of us. And yet, Tu Bishvat gives us a message that there is hope. There is a future. And we look forward to that uh, brighter future ahead of us. All right, well, I think, I think the comparisons might be obvious, but, you know, what can we learn then from Tu Bishvat about dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, for example? Well, I think that corona has given us a, an opportunity also to slow down our lives a little bit. We run very fast-paced lives. The rat race runs us, you know, crazy day and night, and we work, you know, incredibly long hours. And suddenly this has been forced us to slow down a little bit. With all the challenge of it, I think there's a silver lining that we can, you know, stop and smell the roses. We can take in stock of nature. The land is rejuvenating itself. The air quality is purifying. Um, we can really... It start, it start to enjoy the more important things of family and and the uh, nature around us and the gifts that God has given us. So therefore, even though it's been so challenging, I think there's uh, benefits in Tu Bishvat being a holiday of nature and the beautiful uh, land that God has given us. We can take stock in that even more so this year because we have the time and the opportunity to reflect on the gifts that we have in our lives. All right, so that said, I think everybody out there who's watching, you know, Stay safe, stay distance, socially distance, wear your masks, and, you know, maybe plant a tree sure. somewhat locally instead of going <laughs> off somewhere or, or uh, big, family, uh, big family dinners. <laughs> Rabbi Constantine, thank you so much for being with us, and happy to be shot. Happy to be shot to all your viewers. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight, it's a mixture of rain and partly cloudy skies with lows up and down the country averaging at about 49 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. Then it'll be more of the same throughout the weekend with highs averaging about 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. Now, of course, before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. <laughs> Is that, oh, I'm only now seeing the dog helping out. Aw. That is the best. Best kinds of friendship right there. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.28 shekels to the American dollar and 2.56 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then, of course, don't forget to visit the all-new and improved ILTV website at ILTV.tv and let us know what you think. 
and subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates while you're there. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching and happy holidays.